in the fifth chapter of, of Romans, the argument is made by Paul to refute a false doctrine that had arisen among the Christians in Rome. They thought they could continue in sin because of the grace of God and it would just continue to cover them. They could do whatever they wanted because of that grace. So Paul begins chapter six, what we now know as chapter 6 with this question. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin so that grace may increase or may abound? May it never be, or God forbid, some translations say. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? We have five points to the lesson today. And we'll ask this question. Shall we continue in sin? As we go through this today, I want you to think of your own life. If you're not a Christian, you are in sin. And you've got an answer. You need to give an answer to this question. Will I leave here today continuing in sin? Or perhaps you are, have already become a Christian, have been baptized into Christ, had your past sins forgiven, but you have gone back into the world, and you are living in sin. You want to have your cake and eat it too. You want to think, let others think that you are a Christian, but in reality, you're living in sin. So the question is for you today too. Shall you continue in sin? Paul will answer this question for us. The Bible answers this question for us. And we'll look at it today. First question. Shall we continue in sin when we know the history of sin? In Genesis 3, we see that Adam and Eve disobey God. They sin. God said, you shall not. The serpent deceived Eve and said, you will not surely die, as God had told her that she would. God was speaking of a spiritual death, a separation. Eve did not listen to God. She instead listened to the devil and the deceitfulness of the devil. We pick up the reading in verse 8. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree, and I ate. And then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The first sin is recorded for us here in this chapter of Genesis. And we all know the account of how it happened, how the serpent was deceiving to Eve. And it's so it has been with man since this time. We sometimes will give in to the temptations that are put before us. The devil is very crafty, very deceitful, very powerful, but he is not more powerful than God. And we must realize and understand the history of sin in order for it not to be repeated. We have to understand that we can overcome the sin in our lives. In the book of Romans, chapter 3, beginning in verse 9, Paul, writing here, says, What then? Are we better than they? Not at all, for we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. And then he quotes from the Psalms and from the book of Isaiah. Beginning in verse 10, he says, As it is written, There is none righteous. Not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for, good, for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. 
There is no fear of God before their eyes. The Jews and Greeks of the first century Rome, in Rome that Paul is writing to had this, I, had this problem of sin. And so we too today. And it was not only those in Rome who had this problem. In 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 and 10, we read here Paul writing to this church in Corinth, to Christians. He says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And he goes on in verse 11 to say, Such were some of you. Christians come out of sin. I think sometimes we forget that fact. We have come out of sin. And we need to stay out of sin. Stay away from a sinful life. We should not be continuing in sin. Because we can read of the history of sin, and we know our own history of how we came out of that sin. And because of that, we can have knowledge to know not to go back into that way of life. Question number two. Shall we continue in sin when we know the, the deceitfulness of sin? In the book of Hebrews, chapter 3, beginning, beginning in verse 12. The Bible says, Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Every one of us can probably talk about some person that we know who became a Christian and then fell away. And it's sad, but it does happen. We must all understand that none of us are above going back into sin. We definitely do not want that to be. And in this scripture, we learn that we need to encourage one another not to do this, not to be a victim of the deceitfulness, not to be a victim of the hardening of the heart, of a changing of mind, back into the sinful world. Take care, brethren. Take care. It's something that we should do individually, certainly. But this scripture encourages us to do it collectively as well. We all need encouragement to go, to keep on keeping on. To go the way, to go the way that Jesus would have us to go. Proverbs 14 and verse 12 says, There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. We cannot, we cannot tell God, I'm going to do it this way. And because I'm sincere and I'm a good person, and I don't cheat anybody, and I'm honest, you, got it, you have to accept it, God. Now, we may not say it in those words, and people may not say it in those words, but that's what they're saying. Well, I'm sincere. We all want to serve the same God. But here the wise man tells us, it may seem right to a man, but its way is the way of death. We must understand and know the deceitfulness of sin and turn to God always. Jesus was speaking to some Jews in John chapter 8 and verse number 44. He told them this, You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. It's an interesting passage that Jesus gives them here. And the Jews that he was speaking to at the time must have been just 
insulted by the words that Jesus gave them. They were of the children of Israel. They were of the children of Israel, whose God was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jesus is saying, you're of your father, the devil. My friends, I want you to know, if you're not following God, if you're not following Jesus, as is outlined in the New Testament, you are of the devil as well. Now, that's a hard saying. But it's what the Bible teaches. And we need to understand that there's only one or one or other way that these things can go. We are either for God or we are against God. And if we are against God, then we are for the devil, whether we want to admit it or not. And Jesus needed them to understand that they weren't for God. And because of that, their father was the devil. And we need to understand that as well. Shall we continue in sin when we know the deceitfulness of sin? Over and over and throughout the Bible it says, do not be deceived. We need to take heed to that and understand that the deceitfulness of sin can get us as well as it can anyone else. Question number three, shall we continue in sin when we know the power of sin? Second Peter chapter 2. He's talking about some people that were full of sin. And in verse number 14, he, he describes them this way. Having eyes full of adultery that never cease from sin. Enticing unstable souls. Having a heart trained in greed, accursed children. I would suggest to you that their hearts were trained in greed because they trained them that way themselves. We train our minds and our hearts the way that we want our minds and our hearts to be. Now, if we want our hearts and our minds to be right, we will train them with the things of God and Christ. But if we do not, we are training them of the things of the devil, of the lust and the greed that is in the world. We can train our minds for good if we understand the power that is in sin. Going back to the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. Listen to these words from the writer, beginning in verse 14. Pursue peace with all men, and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled. That there be no immoral or godless person like Esau, who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought for it with tears. If we reject the inheritance that can be had in Christ. It can't be found anywhere else. If we reject the inheritance that God has willingly given us. We reject that. It can't be found in anything else in this world. It can only be found in Christ. God has given us one way to come to him and one way only. Hebrews chapter 2, 4, 14 and 15. Words of encouragement. He says, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death, he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their life. Jesus gives us power over sin. We can know that we can have it when we are in Christ, and only when we are in Christ. Question number four. Shall we continue in sin when we know the consequences of sin? There are definitely physical consequences that happen in sin. But more important than that, there are spiritual consequences. And that's what we'll focus on these next few moments. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, a passage I hope that is familiar to you. The Bible says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor is his 
ear so dull that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. God does not leave you. You separate yourself from God through your sinful actions. We must understand the consequence of sin. In the book, again, of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, a sin we may not think of very often. Sin is divisive. Paul, talking to these Christians here, beginning in verse 10, he starts to exhort them with the things that they were doing that were incorrect, that were sinful. He says, Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. Divisiveness causes unrest, and it is sinful. Divisiveness causes strife, and it is sinful. When we look at God's word, we all need to be in one mind, understanding that the judgment of the scriptures is what we should be looking at. When the scriptures tell us something to do, that is what should judge our hearts and our minds. To be in complete compliance with what God says, with what Jesus has taught us. Romans 6 and verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul concludes his talk here in this verse in this chapter and we'll look again at Romans 6 in a moment we need to understand that sin equals death or a separation from God we need to understand the consequences of sin there are some who blame God when they sin James talks about this in James chapter 1 beginning in verse 13 Notice what he says. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil. And he himself does not tempt anyone. Let's pause there for a moment. I want you to understand what James is saying here. I cannot say, well, God made me this way and it's his fault, but that's the reason I'm sinning. It's God's fault. It didn't work with Adam, and it's not going to work with us. Adam tried to blame God. If you go back and read that one more time in Genesis 3, he says, the woman you gave me, she's the one that tempted me. So was it God's fault that Adam sinned? Absolutely not. God does not cause you to sin, ever. And we certainly should not be blaming him or anyone else for our own actions. Verse 14 of James 1 says, But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. The Bible is clear what happens when we sin. It's a separation. It's a death. The book of Ezekiel chapter 18 I encourage you to go and read this entire chapter at some point. Today would be a good day to do that. Ezekiel 18 talks in great detail how we are, we are responsible for our own actions. And we're going to look at verse 20 because that sort of sums the whole chapter up. But if you go back and read it, he gives great detail and the different things that can happen and will happen when we sin. And in verse 20, he sums it up. The person who sins will die. The person. The son will not bear the punishment for the father's iniquity, nor will the father bear the punishment for the son's iniquity. The righteousness of the righteous will be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself. Now let me make it clear that we not misunderstand this passage. This does not mean, parents, you don't have a responsibility to raise your kids in the instruction and admonition of the Lord. It's not a contradiction to that, to that scripture. What this means is, is when we become 
when we become of age, we are accountable. We are accountable, and sooner or later, kids leave the house. I'm finding that out. They are going to go out on their own into the world. And their sin is no longer my responsibility. I am no longer obligated to keep raising them. Do I need to encourage them? Yes, they're a brother and sister in Christ. I need to encourage them. I need to help them. But my son's sin is now his. It's his. And he will have to answer for himself. Ezekiel makes that plain. God makes that plain through Ezekiel. Sin separates man from God. That's the consequence of sin. Now we may say, well, I don't want to be separated from God. Well, there's only one way to prevent that. There's only one way to prevent that, to have the forgiveness through Christ. If you're not in Christ, you don't have that forgiveness. You are separated from Christ, from God, if you are not in Christ. There's no other way it can be. The Bible is clear on that. All spiritual blessings are in Christ, Ephesians 1 and chapter, chapter 1, verse number 3. We have to understand that. It can't happen any other way. I can't have forgiveness. I can't be in a right relationship with God without being in Christ. I can't have any spiritual blessing without being in Christ. Question number five. Shall we continue in sin when we know the destination of sin? In Matthew, the seventh chapter, again, a verse you should be familiar with, beginning in verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons? And in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Another word for lawlessness is sin. You who practice sin. Sincerity does not equal. It does just never has equaled the right thing. I can be sincere about worshiping this podium. Doesn't mean I'm going to be pleasing to God. In Matthew, the 25th chapter, we're given a picture of judgment. In the verse number 46... Jesus concludes that with these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The these that he's talking about are, are the goats, the ones on the left, that did not do the things that they were instructed to do. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning in verse 7, it's a life and death statement is given to us. The Bible says, And to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well, when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Hell is going to be an awful place. And part of that awfulness, part of that destruction and punishment, is that you will be away from the presence of God. This is a life and death statement. Shall we continue in sin? The consequences of sin you do not want. There's a saying that I came across in my studies. First of all, the answer should always be a resounding no. Shall we continue in sin? No. That's what we should be saying. The saying that I came across says sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, 
and cost you more than you want to pay? Certainly the answer to the question should be a resounding no. The book of Romans is an interesting pat there's interesting study in this book. Paul talks about the battle that goes on between our spiritual side and our fleshly side. And we all have both of those, every one of us. And Paul talks about this in the seventh chapter, beginning in verse 24, going through 8 and verse 1. He says, Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh, the law of sin. Notice verse 1, though, of chapter 8. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Once again, if you're not in Christ, there is condemnation. When we walk in the light as he is in the light, 1 John 1 that's when we have forgiveness of our sins. We can't walk in the light if we don't become one of the light. We must be in Christ. If you go back to the text in Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 3, Paul gives the answers. But he asks one more question. He says, or do you not know that all of us, that is Christians, who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, have been baptized into his death? So he asked him this one more question. Don't you understand what you did when you became a Christian? He says, therefore, because we did that, we have been buried with him, that is Christ, through baptism into death. So that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, let me say that again, we should know this, that our old self, that sinful person, was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin for he who has died is freed from sin you may not have realized it when you were baptized but I hope that you did you put away those sinful practices you are to put away those sinful practices and not continue in sin. That's what Paul's telling them. It, it, it doesn't give you a license to sin because of God's grace. It gives you the freedom to no longer be in that sinful relationship. And now in a beautiful, wonderful relationship with Christ. For he who has died is freed from sin. The answer should be a resounding no. So the question today is, what's your answer? What will your answer be? It has eternal consequences. We're going to sing a song, and I asked Thomas, and I appreciate him using this song. Because I want you to think about it. Shall we continue in sin? What will your answer be? Where will you spend eternity? God has given you a way to have sin removed from your life. If you've not been baptized into Christ, the sin is in your life. Whether you want to believe that it is or not, doesn't make a difference. God has said it. God has said it, and that's the way it is. You can have that sin removed today. If you have been baptized and had that sin removed once, but have gone back into sin, as those Christians in Rome had done, Paul said, are we going to continue? Are you going to continue in sin? God forbid. But if you're doing that, you need to make it right today. And you can. Come together now while we stand and sing.